Call 67979981. Monday morning, good morning to you. I hope everything is good with you and I hope you can stay with us between now and midday today. This is Adrian Kennedy. And this is 98FM's Dublin Talks. Now, it's the conversation that has dominated this entire nation over the weekend, if not the entirety of planet Earth. Yesterday, the news broke that a school in Dublin was to close due to um, a confirmed case of COVID-19, the uh, coronavirus COVID-19. The school... Uh, which has been named by many media outlets this morning, despite the HSE not naming it. And um, we here at 98FM have uh, taken a uh, policy decision to not name the school. Anyway, it's to close for uh, two weeks after being confirmed as close contacts of the first case of coronavirus in the Republic of Ireland. Now, the principal, staff and parents of pupils of the school were all notified. They all received a letter and many of you, I'm sure, at this stage have seen uh, the letter, if not a a, a screenshot of it. Uh, We actually have the entire letter here in front of us. Um, This was sent to everybody involved in this particular uh, school. It, It includes a referral letter to your GP. It includes uh, tips and hints on how to uh, deal with the coronavirus, uh, all about washing your hands, coughing and sneezing. It's a six-page letter and then information leaflet about the uh, coronavirus. Anyway, the HSE emergency team said the following um, a risk assessment. The school will close for the duration of the incubation period, which is 14 days. All pupils and teachers are being asked to restrict their movements until the end of the incubation period and will receive guidance on the meaning of restricted movements. However, there's been a lot of criticism, I have to say, uh, over the last 24 hours from members of the public regarding the decision of the HSE not to name the school. Uh, This was apparently done out of uh, privacy for the staff and pupils and to stop mass hysteria that may prevent others from coming forward. Others believe that the HSE should have named the school. I want to find out which side you are on. Here's Here's the reality of this, okay? We live in an age of social media sharing that it was never, ever going to be possible to not identify this school. Now, we've taken a decision not to name the school on this program today, but the vast majority of you already know the name of the school. So it seems a little bit silly because some parent or some teacher shared a screenshot of the letter from the HSE and it says a case of novel coronavirus COVID-19 COVID-19 has been identified in a person in such and such a school. As a result... To prevent the possible spread of infection, the school has been closed from the 1st of March until Monday the 16th of March. As a precaution, all students and staff at the school are being treated as possible contacts of the case. Uh, The letter goes on to explain what this means and what to expect over the next 14 days. Anyway, as I said, on the one hand... I understand why the HSE decided not to name this school. Because it does create a little bit of hysteria. On the other hand, in 2020, it seems pointless. I actually um, passed by the particular school on my way to work today. And there were press photographers outside the school. And that's what they're trying to avoid. And they're also trying to avoid identifying this particular young fella. And my worry is that because we all have this desire, this need to know, on the one hand, when the HSE announced uh, this case yesterday, I said within a week, I'd, uh, within a few hours, I would know the name of the school. And lo and behold, within an hour, I knew the name of the school. 
Is the HSE right in the way they're dealing with this? 67979981 is our telephone number. Text, WhatsApp, or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. Now, um, let me go to one of the uh, parents uh, affected by the closure of this uh, particular uh, school. Alan, welcome to 98FM. Thank you. Now, Alan, we, um, we, as I mentioned a moment ago... Um, have a, a a policy here at the radio station that we've decided to, to go along with the HSE and not name this school, which in many ways seems pointless, but that's the way it is. You have a daughter in this school. I do, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, the, I suppose it's common knowledge where it is now. Um, it's been doing the rounds. Actually, we're doing the rounds on social media before the story even broke because the students were aware of what was going on. Mm. In fact, the letter was received by people before the HSE made their statement yesterday. Is that right? Yes. Uh, well, well, yes and no, actually. I was talking to the HSE this morning and yesterday evening just to say that we actually were informed after the press conference was made. Okay, so t- tell me how you were notified. How were you contacted? We got an email. An email. From the school it's or from the HSE? Every, everybody had got. From the school or from the HSE? Uh, from the HSE, but it, it contained within a, a letter from the school, if, if you know what I mean. Right, okay. Like the, school was, the school was named on the email, and actually that, that actual uh, kind of picture had gone viral. No, yes, uh, no, I, I, like I said, I... One of our neighbours had, had sent us that. I had that on my phone within 10 minutes of the HSE uh, press conference yesterday, so... Um, uh, uh, but let me ask you firstly, Alan, as um, the father of a child in this school... Do you support the HSE's decision not to name the school publicly? Uh, but, you know, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's out there. All they're worried about really is that, you know, when it's named, that the responsibility for that doesn't come back to them. But this has been done around on social media. I mean, I've, I've seen it. It's kind of gone a bit of hysteria. I'm more concerned about actually how they're dealing with what's happened. Mm. Um, Do you understand the need to not identify uh, the young man who's in quarantine in hospital now? Well, yeah, there's patient confidentiality. I mean, again, his picture has gone viral as well. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, at the end of the day, there is a sick... I mean, this Sorry, his photograph has actually done sick. the rounds? Yeah, yeah. That's, well, that's disgraceful. Kind of, but, but yeah, well, social media is there. It's... Uh, you know what teenagers are like? Mm. It's, it's just, it's out there. I mean, every, as I said, there's no kind of confidentiality thing about this on the ground because everybody's been aware. I okay, mean, so on the one hand, you understand... On the one hand, you understand the HSE's need not to... or the decision not to name the school and, uh, by implication, the identity of the young fella. But on the other mm. hand, you're saying... And this is the point I was making at the start. It's 2020. It seems pointless. Because it's, pointless, isn't it? it's not really relevant because people will know. If you want to know, just go on Facebook, go on Instagram. Mm. It's all you, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So let me ask what, you then, Alan. Why, why would you want to do that anyway? And let me ask you then, Alan, you got this letter. I have a copy of it here in front of me. I have the entire thing. Um, it includes a, is this a referral letter to your GP? Yeah. Well, obviously, when I got this yesterday, I was like, wow, well, this is like, what's going on here? Mm. This is, this is so. Uh, I think the thing that we took from what we didn't listen to the kids during the week. The children have been talking about this all week. Uh, this was first flag last Tuesday. Uh, I mean, this guy was in Italy, uh, where the uh, people had passed away from the disease. Came back, was returned to school, uh, and had been sick in school and was kept in school. He was only sent home at eleven o'clock on Friday. Um, and. It's just, I don't, I don't understand why... Okay, so, you, so your point and, is and that, that, point, that this was allowed to continue for the entire the week. Want to, the skills I want to talk about who it is to protect him, but really to protect them. Uh, so your argument is that it was known that this young man was sick for the week but still stayed in school? 100%, yes. I've said this to the HSC. Spoke so to are, you, are, are you Thursday saying that the HSE or the school didn't act quickly enough? 100%. Would you put the blame on the HSE? I would blame the school and the HSE. Uh, They were dealing with this on Friday. They have a press conference on Sunday. Uh, There's a question attached to that school that's still open. 
And let me ask you, although there mightn't be any, uh, you know, crossover between the creche and the school, but let me ask you this then. The, 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 well, you have to walk by the creche to get into the school. Right, OK. Um, let me ask you then, what is happening with your, uh, your child, who is a student at this school, off for the next two weeks? Um, is your child self-isolating, as the, as the expression goes? Well, actually, because I asked them what, what exactly that means, and they're like, well, look, just you just keep her at home and keep her away from kind of now or less the general population. But my point to them is this. We have siblings who have been told to go to school. Mm. Now, the schools are pandemonium about that because the schools are all supposed to follow HSC policy. The HSC policy today is to send them to school and myself go to work. Life continues on. That's fine. But other schools are now saying do not send siblings, that they shouldn't be sent to schools. Which is confusing the issue because then people who have been told to send them in are like, well, why are they being told not to send them in? So okay, so, no you, so you, you have one child who is a student at this school uh, who's yes. staying at home. Um, she has multiple siblings. And how, ma- how many siblings are we talking about? Three. Three. All gone to school today. Yeah. No, no, we kept them off. Oh, you kept them off. Okay, so you kept them off off. out of uh, an abundance of caution, basically, to in order that perhaps one of them doesn't take it into their school. Well, you see, we don't really know because the the, the inoculation period is 14 days. And this is what I said to you this morning. We just basically have to sit around for 14 days and hope our daughter doesn't get sick, Mm. haven't been exposed, and and she shouldn't have been. I know that's going to be another argument for another day. She shouldn't have been in the circumstances exposed to what happened. And then, let me ask you then, that. Alan. They won't um, screen her because the, the screening, they said, she could be cleared today but not clear tomorrow. So the actual screening doesn't really work. It's not exhaustive. Yes, exactly. That's that's what the 14 days is for um, yes. because it can take up to 14 days to present itself, basically. Yes, yeah, so the, the chap involved, I think it took him seven days. Okay, let me ask you then, um, again, I'm very conscious that we don't identify anybody here. Um, I'm very conscious that we don't identify the school. Would your child have had any direct contact with this individual? But this is my issue with the HSC when they're identifying people who are at risk. They're saying that my daughter wasn't directly at risk. She sat uh, beside him in one of the classes. Okay, so yes is the answer to my question. The guidelines is something if you're two metres, within two metres for more than 15 minutes. You're, so by that guideline, yes, they are. I said that to them, they're saying no, they're not. I'm like, well, look, she has to be. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. She's seen him being sick. So she was that close to him in terms of contact? Yes, absolutely, yeah. And I said the, the particular individual was in the school for four days. And again, um, uh, you know, I... This is obviously going to uh, develop as a story in terms of the way in which the HSE are dealing with it. So your main gripe is that this particular uh, young fellow was in the school. He was there uh, last week, not well, and several children, yeah. including your own child, would have had contact with him. Multiple children, more than that. Um, dozens. Uh, like the classrooms are not that big. It's, it's, okay, let me ask you then, Alan. Are you, are, are you worried... Absolutely. I mean, this is a right here now, um, and I, I know you can't look back or whatever, but look, the area that the, the individual in question came from was identified. It was clearly on a list. Should never have been returned to the school. It was. Uh, and then was identified as being ill in the school. Should have been taken out immediately. Wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, this went on for days. Then, as I said, the HSE meet over the weekend. They issued statements late last night. Uh, we got our email around half past six on a Sunday evening. But they'd already had a press conference. Um, and the plan is just basically see if your daughter gets sick in the next 14 days and if she doesn't, grant. That's not a plan. Like what else? Be, okay, but let, me, all, let me ask you, all what else could be... kilometers should have been shut. shut Sorry, schools. say that again. All the schools within five kilometres should have been shut. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Whatever, yeah, whatever. I mean, ten kilometres, whatever. Shut all the schools in Dublin. Whatever you need to do. Because, like I said, we were at children's parties over the weekend. We've been around a lot of people. The people who have been in the classroom with this person, I mean, if you multiply out all the places they've been in the last week, it's a lot of places and a lot of people that they've been in contact with. Now, to me, that's, that's how you contain something. Uh, There's been much we, talk the, about... The lady on the phone this morning, the HP hotline, is a doctor. She was saying it's just precautionary. I said, well, it's not precautionary because somebody has now caught this disease. So it's reactive. It's not precautionary. 
What else? Okay, so you're saying that schools within a radius of, of uh, this particular school should have been shut. Uh, do you want yes, to see... Because, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, because they, they all would get similar buses and they would be on buses. So there's a number of schools within a direct radius of that school and they would share buses. And they have last week, all of last week they did that. Okay, but you said yourself, you, uh, are you at work today? I am. Should you be at work today? I was today? Told to work by four different people. Personally, I don't think so. Well, I have not been given permission to not go to work. Have you told your employer about your concerns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, spoke to multiple people, uh, senior people, yeah. And they said, well, just get on with it. They referred me to the HSC. <laughs> it's a vicious circle then, because it just keeps going round and round. It is. Uh, see, here's the irony. I work within the HSC. You work for the HSE? Uh, yeah, well, not directly, but they, they pay our wages. I can't name her. Okay, okay no, that's too. fine, that's fine, that's fine. Right, this is this sounds extremely frustrating. Um, I, I, I'm just wondering, Alan, if what way you think the HSE should be handling this? Closing more schools, closing more businesses, is that what you want? Well, I think it's better look at it this way. Obviously, this is, this is new territory for everybody, okay? Um, you know, just looking at my own friends, family, neighbours... People are very alarmed. I mean, they're like people are losing their minds a bit over this, right? I know I'm not one of those people. I just want an absolute clinical response that deals with the issue, not hysteria, because unfortunately that's what happens with these kind of things. But and isn't that, isn't that isn't that what has happened in the way in which, for example, this letter has been widely circulated uh, on social media, despite the fact that the HSE didn't identify the school, just said it was in the east of Ireland. Now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in two minds as to whether that's the right thing to do or not. Because I think wait, wait, by not where, identifying where the, the... Sorry, I, 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 I think by not? not identifying the school adds to the hysteria. Well, it's, it's a speculation, yeah. I mean, people go online, but I mean, look, you can find out who it is fairly handy enough. But to me, that doesn't actually deal with the actual clinical problem on the ground. They should have said anyone in contact. Like, we're talking about somebody who'd been in a school for four days who had presented signs of being ill. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a fact. Uh, there, there must be 30 to 40 children in direct contact with, with that child. So, and teachers and staff and etc. You know, or you join the docs along the way. And to me, any siblings should have been said no. No siblings should go to school. But they're saying that's okay. You're obviously fearful that as a result of this young fellow being in the school last week, there's going to be a mass outbreak as a result of this. Are you? Oh, I don't know about mass outbreak. I mean, that's. An outbreak, you know then. Like an outbreak. This, is, this disease is a new thing to everybody. But what I'm saying is, to try and avoid a possible outbreak or a spread, you need to contain, and part of containing it is to take the people who have been in contact and then their extended people and try and take them out of the equation. That hasn't happened. Okay, um, but in the meantime, you're at work, uh, your kids are at home, are they going to stay at home and stay indoors for two weeks, as has been advised? I don't know, actually, to be honest, because they haven't actually been advised that. Only one of them has been, that's my point. Yes, okay, but you've, t- you've taken the choice to keep the others at home. At home. Yes, yes, yeah, and we, and we, do you know what we're going to see, because we're liaising with the school itself, we're going to see what, what that, I, mean, I don't know what you can do, because obviously you could, you can test everybody in the house today. As I said, they're fine, and then tomorrow they may not be. Yes. Who knows? Uh, your, 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 your child could have this and not show any signs for the next 14 days, but could still have it mm. and give it to other people. So I just think that the, I think the, the hell the HTC have dealt with it, it's not contained. It's not a plan. Like it's not, it doesn't resemble anything you uh, you know, looking like a plan. To say that there's children in other schools can go who have been around possibly people who have been definitely in contact with this person. We don't know how the end, we won't know for 14 days. I, I just, I don't know. I just think it, it doesn't really tally. And I said the message has been inconsistent. Some skills are saying one thing, some skills are saying another. Okay, and you're, you're not filled with confidence by the sounds of it? No, absolutely not. And I, I did say that to the unfortunate doctor this morning. I said, you know, it isn't the plan just to sit at home for the next two weeks and hope my daughter doesn't get sick. That seems to be just where we're at. Okay, Alan, with your uh, consent, we will keep in touch with you over the next couple of days. Um, obviously, problem, yeah. yeah, obviously, our listeners are very interested in, in what you're being advised as a parent of a child from that school. Um, uh, so if it's okay with you, we'll keep in contact with you uh, during the week. Our Jeremy will uh, contact you privately um, later on today. 
No problem at all. Thanks very much indeed, Alan. Good to talk Thanks to you. Thanks for that. And, and, the, uh, and the very best of luck with everything. I hope everything is okay, and I hope none of your children or yourself or any of your family develop it. Hopefully, and uh, as well, just for, for the person in question, uh, because uh, he seems to be being forgotten about in front of the hysteria, just hopefully that he's doing okay. Absolutely, 100%. Yep. I'm talking to the, the, the pupils and that, you know, I mean, they are concerned that's kind of not being kind of to the fore of anything. I mean, they're really worried about, about how he is. Alan, good to talk to you, and thanks very much indeed for uh, okay. for sharing your story with us. That Alan is a parent of one of the children from this uh, particular school. And by the way, there's no point in sending us in a copy of the letter. The amount of WhatsApps we're after getting with that letter, we've gotten the letter. I got the letter yesterday at about whatever, t- five o'clock, half five yesterday. We have the entire letter that was sent out to parents in this school. Um, and it is, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six pages. Uh, the first page says, Dear Parent, and goes on to say, to prevent the possible spread of infection, the school has been closed from the 1st of March till the 16th of March. As a precaution, all students and staff at the school are being treated as possible contacts of the case. Now, you heard Alan Alan's child was most certainly a contact of the case. And it goes on to explain what is coronavirus, what is my risk, what happens next, what are the symptoms of COVID-19 and what you should do. Uh, Coming up shortly, we will be speaking to a a medical expert uh, in this field about what we should and shouldn't do. And if you have any questions that you'd like me uh, to uh, put to um, Professor Anthony Staines, uh, you can WhatsApp it to us on 0877 98 98 98. Therese, Ashling, and Sorkin, my apologies for keeping you waiting. I'll be with you as soon as the ad break's finished. The sound of the city from Sagart to Sutton. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. Coming up in a couple of minutes, I'm going to be talking to uh, Professor Anthony Staines, who is an expert on this whole field. And if you have a question that you want me to put to him, send me a WhatsApp voice note to 87 98 Keep it short, keep it concise and ask a question and we will put those questions directly uh, to Professor Staines. So once again, if you have a question that you want to ask about uh, this virus... Um, Please send us a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. Now, we're in the middle of a conversation about the announcement yesterday that a particular school here in uh, Dublin has been closed for two weeks. And we're asking, can you understand the decision by the HSE not to name this particular school? Uh, not well. Uh, look, I think everybody understands the need not to identify the young fella in question. Uh, but um, do you understand the need not to name the school and why they did that, or is this just adding to more hysteria? Because the fact of the matter is, we all know the name of the school now. We knew the name of the school yesterday evening. I knew the name of the school within five minutes of the press conference, and. It, I, I'm wondering, does it achieve anything by the HSE not naming the school? If this were the 1950s, I'd say yes, because the word won't get out. But it's not the 1950s. It's 2020 when literally within seconds people can share the information. Um, now, Therese, you're on 98FM. Hi, Therese. Hi, hey, Brian. Now, your, uh, your child is um, in a school close by. Yeah, two or three. In my so you, so uh, I, 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 Therese, I'm very conscious not to identify this school because oh, we're going along with the with the HSE's guidelines. It seems pointless, but we are. Um, let me ask you: You're worried. One of the things that Alan, that father who was on a couple of minutes ago, was saying that all schools in the area should have been closed. Definitely, they should because they should have went in and fumigated them or something because. We have young children that are the siblings of that school that has been closed. Yes. Our children are close to their brothers and sisters. And, 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 in fact, yeah, and in fact, what, what we heard from Alan is that his other children go to different schools and he exactly. has chosen to keep his kids off school, but he wasn't told to keep his kids off school. Yeah, I got a text message from the school. That... Sorry, Therese, we're losing you there. You did, uh... um, can you hear me? Yeah, go on. I got a text message from the, from our own school last night and it just gave us the option if we wanted to keep our children off school. It didn't say we should. It said if you feel that your child 
needs to stay off school, basically. So I took it upon myself to keep my child off school. And are you going to keep your child off school for two weeks? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm not well myself at the minute, Adrian. I have been just out of a big operation. And my little girl had her 12th out in October. So, like, I'm not sure what to do. I have, like, had breast cancer. So it's a big risk factor for me. Mm. You know, that way. So I'm not sure what to do. I'm trying to see what everybody else is doing because I don't understand what's going on, basically. Now, can I ask you, you you say you've chosen to keep your child at home who goes to a nearby school. Yep. Um, uh, By doing that, are you self-isolating? In other words, are you keeping your child at home and in the house? Well, I am for now till we run out of food. (laughs) Pretty much, yeah. Right, okay, so you've made that decision that your child isn't going to school and um, you are keeping your child indoors. Yep, I'm mean, keeping myself indoors, if possible, Adrian, because there's going to be times where we're going to have to grow, have to pay bills, have to live. Well, she has to live, we still have to live. But it's just trying to, to uh, isolate ourselves is very hard, you know, don't we? You see, I'm, I'm thinking back to what you were saying about all schools in the immediate area should have been closed. The fact of the matter is that your kids could be going to a school out uh, in another part of Dublin. Do you close the entire city down? That's you, well, you know, like, but like the school. Question. I was not going to mention it. Like, yeah, no, I, I, I know the school you're talking about, and I know how close it is yeah. to the school in question. Yeah, you know, like our, our, my little girl is in that class with relatives of the children that go to the school in question, like. So they've been open to those kids all week, all of last week, as Alan said. Mm. You know, which is, we sh- like, to, the school and the Eastern Health Board. I think the government needs to make a stand. It shouldn't be down to the principal, and it shouldn't be down to, it should be down to the government and the HSB to say, listen, close all the schools. shouldn't be personal choices. Because at the end of the day, we don't know whether we're making the right choice or the wrong choice. Okay, so you believe that... At this moment, you've made the right decision in keeping your uh, child home from school. It goes Absolutely. to a different it goes, who goes to a different nearby school, um, yeah. and you will continue to do that until you're told otherwise. Well, I will, Adrian. But um, I'm, I'm also afraid the toast be getting on to me that my child's going to be off school. But I'm hoping that's all going to be like sorted out. Like they they understand that we're keeping our kids off for the right reasons, not the wrong reasons. What do you think of the HSE not identifying the school? Um, I can kind of understand it because of the poor child. I can understand it because they didn't want a name and shame that poor child nothing to do with that poor child. But you know, Facebook and stuff is like sending that little kind of photograph and stuff around. I can understand that. But I still think they shouldn't have just said the East. It was... In in my opinion, it was ridiculously vague and all it was doing was uh, was making people search for it. Okay, stay there for a second. Um, let me go to Sorka. You're on 98 FM. Hi, Sorka. My apologies for keeping you on hold no, so long. You're fine. Um, you believe when it comes to the identification of a school like this, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the stage that I feel a bit silly not naming the school because everybody knows it anyway, but we've yeah. made that decision. Let me ask you, Sorka, you believe we all have a right to know? 100% we do. 100%. I think the HSC are failing us. Um, I think the government are failing us. Um, last night, I was in the kitchen. I got upset. I didn't want to. I have a daughter, 18, in secondary. Um, her school and my younger daughter's preschool were all within two kilometres of this said school. Mm-hmm. Even where we live, I, I wasn't going to send them to school today because the the pure panic that goes through you as a parent. Um, this morning, I, my older daughter, she went off to her secondary school when she left, I got a message from her, t- from her secondary school stating, please keep notified from the HSC over what's happening. I was like, brilliant. That's great. Cheers. Nice one. Um, I brought my little girl down to preschool. I told the preschool I wasn't going to send her. And they were like, no, 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 it's fine. And I just happened in passing to say to the manager of the preschool, if her older sister was in this situation, if she'd come back from Italy and she was getting tested for COVID-19, what would you do? She said, well, you wouldn't have to tell us. I went, pardon? She goes, you wouldn't have to tell us. It's a moral thing whether you want to tell us or not. Mm. So I said, well, what if I did tell you? She said, we would have to inform the HSC and the preschool would be shut down. Even though our older sister doesn't go near the preschool, the, the HSC would shut the preschool down. So the point of it is, if that is somebody who hasn't even gone near the preschool, they would shut the preschool down. What is happening to everyone else? So that child is home 
I fair play to Alan for keeping his other three kids out. A big applause for that. Absolutely, but he, that's a choice he wasn't made. Uh, he wasn't yeah, told to he, make. He, he made it himself. He's doing the right thing. He, mm. He's taking this on himself, and I think the parents. It, but leaving it to us as parents to make these decisions is wrong as well. The government and the HSC should be putting all these things into place. I'm on chemotherapy. That girl raised there just said she had breast cancer. I presume she's had chemotherapy. We're immunosuppressed. Absolutely. What happens to us? Mm. You know, um, you're told to put the child in a different room. I have a four-year-old. I can't say to her, stay in a room on your own if anything happens. <laughs> okay, you're saying about us having the right to know um, why, uh, where the school is. The fact is, we do all know where yeah. the school is. Um, do you think it's pointless, the HSE, not identifying the school? I think it's very Irish at its best, isn't it? For God's sake, we were all going to find out. Anyway. Okay, but isn't there a risk, and this is the bit, I didn't realise this because I haven't seen this, that even that young man has been identified on social media. I haven't seen that well, myself. In all honesty, okay, all right. It's, it uh, but, uh, sorry to cut across you, uh, Sorka. I have a big problem with that, identifying the young fellow like okay. that. I think and it's I disgraceful. I understand that. I understand. But, as I said, my older daughter is 18. I know legally now she's an adult. But if it was my four-year-old who had we'll say COVID-19, coronavirus, wherever you want to call it, I would have no shame in people knowing it was my daughter and her name. Because I would feel I was maybe helping other people out. People could say, oh yeah, I was near that child yesterday. Or, you know, let people become informed. It's not bullying. It's not intimidating a child. It's giving people options to... To let them, because people are going about in a panic with but, but I mean, you see, Sorka, this is the reality of, do you, do you want your child becoming a meme? That's what we're talking about here. That's what happened yesterday with this young fellow, I now understand. I didn't realise this was the thing. Uh, I have a major problem with that young fellow being identified by anybody. He has a right to privacy. Oh, he, everybody has a right to privacy, but it's nothing that's an embarrassment. It's nothing It that... is. He becomes a target of um, a focus of attention as being the first case in Ireland. But should we all not just be standing together to, as, as if you want to put it, as a nation and saying we can all support each other through this? Right, he's the first case. We are definitely going to have a second, third and fourth case. Absolutely, if we haven't already. That's exactly, the reality. Exactly. Okay. We're all probably, anyone could be walking around with us. It's not... Let me ask you, Sorka, are you worried? If the HSE are announcing other cases today or tomorrow or the next day, well, do you want them to be more specific? Yeah, I am stone cold worried. I am so worried. As I said, I was not going to put my children in school today. Um, the 18-year-old won't well, like me calling her a child. I, because I feel, you know, I, as, our, as their parent, I have the, you know, I, I can keep them safe. I felt like I'm putting them into the lion's den this morning watching them going off. And it's a horrible feeling as a that parent. That must be a horrible knowing. feeling, yeah. Yeah. All right, Sorka, I wish you well. Thanks very much indeed. Um, where am I going? Uh, Ashling, you're on 98FM. Hi, Ashling. Hi, how are you? You also believe that the HSE should be publicly identifying um, this particular school? Well, absolutely. I have listened to uh, Alan there and uh, the other ladies talk, and I have absolutely no faith in the HSE now. I um, and haven't been dealt with them for the last 18 years. Um, my son is 18 now, and he has a very severe underlying health condition. He works... Uh, and we live in the east of the country, obviously. Mm -hmm. And on, only by social media is how we know where the coronavirus has, has its first case. Yes. And it's just, it's very worrying for him as he works in, the, in a little shop with people in and out all day long. He's gone off with his hand sanitizer. Um, you know, we're not being told what to do, especially for the vulnerable people people in the in society, you know, people with, I mean, he has severe heart disease. I mean, what is, we've been told basically just get on with stuff or, you know, if you kind of had an idea of where things were, you know, you could kind of say, oh, well, it's not near us, so we'd be a little bit more um, relaxed, you know, yeah. So, like, relaxed, like for example, you know, people in Cork don't have to be worried at this moment because absolutely, it's yeah. in the east. But people yeah. in the east shouldn't have to be as concerned if they live in Meath or if they live down in Wicklow uh, because yeah. we now know it is a school in Dublin. Absolutely. And like, that's what is more annoying. It's the fact that they're causing mass hysteria with people. And you do know, you think that mass God. hysteria is created by the secrecy of not identifying the school? Well, I think so. because Okay, I but, but let, me t let me turn that on its head. Um, this morning, when I was driving into work, I saw two press photographers standing outside the school. Now... I know, which... which that, that, this is part of the reason that they don't. Ways. It's, yeah. it's, it's all... It's media, social media, 
a right to privacy, a right to knowledge. I mean, it's just, I think maybe, maybe for personally, because we have somebody who's vulnerable in society that we might be a little bit more worried or, you know. Mm. Um, yes, no, and I do understand if you, if you have somebody in your family or if you yourself are immunosuppressed or, uh, you know, at, at risk of a virus like this. I understand the absolute concern. Um, the, the majority of you saying that the HSE should have identified uh, this school. Now, they can cover themselves by saying we didn't identify it. Um, then somebody somewhere decided to uh, publish the, the letter received by parents at the uh, school. Uh, we actually have a full PDF copy of the actual letter that we have here in front of us. Anyway, if you have a question that you would like me to put to Professor Anthony Staines, um, send us a WhatsApp voice note right now to 0877 98 98 98. We're only going to take WhatsApp voice notes. We'll play them to him and uh, we'll answer your questions. Um, once again, uh, you send us a WhatsApp voice note with your question for Professor Anthony Staines to 0877 98 The sound of the city from Sally Noggin to Swords. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. And this is Adrian Kennedy. We're here until midday today. As you could quite clearly hear from the first 40 minutes of the programme today, an awful lot of our listeners are deeply, deeply concerned about their children, about um, relatives who would be immunosuppressed, um, particularly in the general area around this particular school here in Dublin that has been closed for two weeks. As as you heard, we spoke to a parent of one of the children uh, from the school. That parent has taken the decision to keep his other kids at home from school. These are kids who go to other schools. Um, we are joined on the line by uh, an expert in public health at uh, DCU, uh, Professor uh, Anthony Staines. If you have a question that you would like me to put to him, send us a WhatsApp voice note to O. 877 98 98 98. Uh, Professor Staines, welcome to 98 FM and thank you very much indeed for uh, for joining us on the programme. Thank you for having me on. Let me ask you firstly, this has been the, the focus of conversation for the first 40 minutes of our programme and you may not have heard all of it. Um, mm-hmm. Why would the HSE have taken a decision not to identify the school in question here? I think the Chief Medical Officer, Tony Holland, put it very well this morning. He, he said, public health has nothing to hide, but we have things to protect. And the two things we have to protect are the, the privacy of the individuals concerned. Because you, know, you, you have the same right to privacy about your health care with a coronavirus infection as you do with anything else. Mm. And the second is our ability to do contact tracing. The way there's no vaccine against this virus, and there there may not be for quite some time. There certainly won't be for the next six to eight months. Although there's lots of studies going on, there are no drugs known that influence the progress of this disease. Most people who get it, it's unpleasant. They get better. A small number of people become seriously ill. Maybe 1% of those who get it will die. Mm. Maybe a bit less than that. So what we can do is stop people getting it. And we do that by doing three things. One is all of us, everybody listening to this program, wash your hands, use tissues, use your elbow if you haven't got tissues. That's very simple stuff. Very simple hand hygiene. It's very effective against flu. We believe it'll be very effective against this virus too. The the second thing is if you think you have symptoms, call somebody. And we don't want people to be afraid that they will call the HSE and raise their head and find the world's press camped on their lawn looking at them. Mm. You, You ring your GP, ring HSE, get advice, act on the advice. And whatever is needed, depending on you, depending on your situation, depending on whether how, how sick you are, you will get the care, the diagnosis that you need 
for your particular situation. Okay, and, so uh, d- d- just to go back to the decision by the HSE not to... Uh, look, I, I think everybody understands the need not to identify uh, the young man in question here. Um, I find it apparent that his picture was actually shared on social media yesterday. Um, I, I, yes, it is. I find that really disgusting. Um, but the naming of the school is something that a lot of people have or the non-naming of the school, particularly in this social media era. In other words, I knew the name of the school within five minutes of the press conference yesterday. I, I gave you an example. This is something I was asked on, on another program. Um, somebody asked me, uh, the, uh, clearly, the, uh, I might. The, what the person said to me was, "Well, I might be at risk around that school, but I'd be absolutely grand in Cork. This is a problem in Dublin." And the answer to that is, "No, it isn't. We know there's a problem in Dublin, and we're we're dealing with that. The person in question is being minded. Everyone who's in, been in contact with him is being checked. All of that's in train. What we don't know is who's in Cork." or who's in Wicklow, or who's in Dundalk, or who's in Carrickmacross, potentially infected. Mm. So the, the real danger is people will say, ah, yeah, that's grand, it's a problem in Dublin. And actually the fact that I have pains in my chest and a temperature, I'm a bit short of breath, that, that doesn't mean anything, because I'm not in Dublin, I'm in Cork. Or I'm not in Dublin. Yes, no, okay, I do, I do understand all of that. But uh, one final question. This is, we spoke with a parent of one of the children from this particular school. Mm-hmm. And he spoke at length about how uh, his child has 100% been in contact with this particular individual in the last mm-hmm. few days. Okay, yeah. And his daughter uh, is at home. Uh, he has kept the other siblings off school. They go to different schools. But he wasn't told to do that. There's always there's a very difficult set of balances. What we we're balancing between a risk of infection and a risk of closing down our society. We know that closing down our society will lead to deaths. We know that we, we, if if people start losing jobs, the death rate goes up. Mm. If people can't get out to get food and water, the death rate goes up. So we're we're trying to walk something of a tight tight tightrope. We're using using the best evidence we've got. The guy who's coordinating all of this globally for WHO, a man called Mike Ryan, is in Sligo. So we we are hooked into the international public health networks. Uh, We have really experienced people, and I'm not one of them. We have loads of really experienced people okay, so, who are used to managing outbreaks. Are okay, so the way in which the HSE is dealing with this, we just have to trust in them that they are dealing with best practice and uh, any of the frustrations that people may be feeling, uh, we need to accept that the HSE is doing what they should be doing. To be honest, yes. I mean, this is a major public health incident and that's what public health people are trained to do. So we, we have the, the skills and the experience and the background and the knowledge of doing this sort of thing for 150 years. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't mean it always works. Okay, I want to uh, put some, best shot. I want to put some questions to you from our listeners, if that's okay. So sure. we've uh, we've asked uh, listeners to send in a WhatsApp voice note to oh eight seven seven ninety eight ninety eight ninety eight. Here's one from Alan. How you doing, Adrian? I'd just like to pose a question to the doctor that's due to come in. Um, I'm just wondering if this virus is man-made or if it was, uh, what was it? Like, did it just come from animals or where did it come from? Where did it originate? Do we know the answer to that, uh, Professor Staines? To, yeah, to a, to a point. We, we know this is a, what's called a coronavirus. There's, and there's a family of these things. One set of members of the family cause common colds a fair proportion of common colds. This isn't closely related. This is kind of a second cousin of those. So this thing is very closely related to a virus that's been found in bats. And the likelihood is it's a bat virus that has now spread to people. That that's the that's the current bet. That it might it might have come from some other animal. But it's prob- probably a bat virus. That, and that, that transferred to humans at some point. Yes. Mm. Very, very recently, because all the the isolates from China are all pretty much the same. And these viruses mutate quickly. 
So they, they look you know, they look a little bit different. Their ears might stick out a bit further, their noses might be a bit shorter. All of the viruses in China look pretty much the same. And all of the viruses in Italy look slightly different, but also pretty much the same. Okay, so here's... it's probably a very, very recent virus that's affected people. And it's, it's not man-made. It's, it's not man-made. Man-made. Okay. All right, here's another question. Does it matter when you wash your hands if the water is hot or cold? That's a good question, actually. I was in a public toilet yesterday, uh, Professor Staines, and the the running water was cold. It's it's best to wash your hands with warm water and soap for about 20 seconds, which is about as long as it takes to sing two verses of Happy Birthday to You. If you haven't got warm water, use cold water. If you haven't got soap, use water. Wash your hands. With what with the best stuff you have available at the time is is the message. Okay, so and ideally warm water and soap, but ideally, uh, yes, ideally. Okay, but, but wash them reasonably. You, a lot of people wash their hands only after they go to the bathroom and maybe when they get up in the morning. You, you ideally wash your hands more often than that. Okay, that, that's how we'll interrupt the spread. Here's another uh, message. Hi, I just have a question for the professor. Um, my son is 12 um, with an underlying heart problem, aortic stenosis, um, and he's due to go to a football match in England this week. And I was just wondering what would his um, recommendations be around this and travelling? Um, there isn't really an answer to that, is there? No, it's a difficult one. I mean, there, there is there are coronavirus cases in, in England, more than there are here. A football match is very crowded. At the moment, the risk of transmission in the UK is very low. And he's probably no greater risk at a match in the UK than he would be at a match here. But, uh, I mean, there's no point telling fairy stories. He is at slightly greater risk at a football match than he would be on the street. Okay. And it's, it's, it's a balance. Like many other things in life, it's a balance. The risk is not high, but it's not zero either. Here's another uh, question from Declan. What about my girlfriend that's uh, 30 weeks pregnant? What's it mean for her? Pregnant women are in a, a, a group of people that we need to be aware of. Is that right? Is that the best way of describing that? Yeah, it, it is. There, there isn't a lot known about it because this is a this is a new virus, and it mainly seems to affect the respiratory tract. Now, it it is the case that severe infection can be very damaging for for a pregnancy. That that is well known, and nothing to particularly do with coronavirus. So there's no there's nothing that I know of. But we there's a lot we don't know about this virus yet. There's nothing specific that I know of about pregnancy and this virus, except that, as you say, pregnant women are a little bit immunosuppressed compared with the non-pregnant women of the same same age. OK, here's another question from uh, Hi, Kevin. Kevin here. Uh, just wondering, if a child got infected and both parents were uninfected, would he suggest, would his rec- I was wondering what his recommendation would be in relation to should one of the parents move away from the family home and one parent stay with the child? Um, I know it's a bit of a weird question, uh, but it is a weird time. OK, thank you very much. Bye. I don't know if there's an answer to that either. It's a, it's a good question, but the, the reality is if you if your child is infected, the where, where that child is best minded is going to be decided by yourselves and the doctors and nurses looking after that child. And they'll give you specific advice based on your individual circumstances. But it, it, at least in the initial stage of the outbreak, I think many of these, many people with this virus will be brought into hospital. Not everyone with the virus by any means needs to be in hospital. Mm. But it's easier to control spread in hospital. But take, take the advice of the doctors and nurses dealing with you and your family, because it'll be much better than any generic advice that someone can give you. Professor Staines, I, I'm going to impose on you and ask for five more minutes of your time, if that's possible. Um, I have to take a very quick commercial break. It's fascinating talking to you, and there's a lot of questions that have come in. I have to take a quick break, and I'll be straight back to you after that break. 
It's 11 o'clock across Dublin. Good morning. This is Adrian Kennedy. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks and this is Trish with Monday's top headlines. Thanks, Adrian. Around 450 students at a secondary school in Dublin are staying at home for the next two weeks as a precaution against the spread of coronavirus. It's after a male student who recently returned from northern Italy became the first person with the virus in the Republic. He's now being treated in hospital in isolation. A man has been seriously injured in a crash on the Soares Road. A number of other people have also been taken to hospital as a precaution after the pile-up shortly before nine this morning. A proposal to rezone industrial land at East Wall for housing has been shelved. It's one of 20 brownfield sites the City Council had earmarked to undergo a change of use. However, the proposal has since been withdrawn over concerns it could impact on future plans to connect up the M50 and upgrade the port tunnel. And health experts are warning children as young as eight are being diagnosed with eating disorders. The age of onset for eating eating disorders was previously 15 to 24. This has now dropped to 13 to 18 years of age and you're up to date on 98. 98 FM Call 67979081 And this is Adrian Kennedy with you until midday today. Um, we're currently talking with um, uh, Professor Anthony Staines who's an expert in public health at uh, DCU. Um, with your questions regarding this whole uh, coronavirus uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, um, Professor Staines, I've been asked to ask you um, in terms of children, are children now at, at, at less risk of this in terms of developing serious uh, consequences? That seems to be the case. There, there, have been very, there has been very a small number of Chinese children who have become seriously ill, but the vast, vast majority of children who've got this infection have had very mild illness. Most of the se- severe illness has been in older people, people over the age of 60. Okay, here's a question from uh, Anna. Hi there. Um, this is just a question with regards to the COVID-19. I'm just wondering, do we know if somebody does get it and say they get over it, is it something that they can recatch again next year? Is this just going to be going around and around? Or once you get it and you deal with it, is that it over and done with? Thanks. Uh, there have been examples, Professor Staines, of people having been cleared of it and it coming back again. A great question. There, There is a serious discussion about it. And the short answer at the moment is nobody really knows. Other coronaviruses you can get more than once because the virus changes enough. So you, that's why you can get colds repeatedly because mm. there, there aren't all that many viruses cause colds. But you, can, you get colds again and again. It is possible that will happen with this virus, but at the moment nobody really knows. Well, if If this virus sticks around, which hopefully it won't, but if it does stick around, what's likely to happen is it will become less severe. It will cause fewer serious illnesses. So that will be the aim. But really, we'd actually prefer to get rid of it now. Absolutely. We, um, we still can if we manage this properly and effectively. OK, here's a question from Gary. Hi, Professor. I'd like to know, uh, what type of people is this uh, virus killing? Is it killing young, healthy, fighting men and women? children or is it people with underlying diseases or elderly just like a common flu would kill you know because I think that's what people are doing but it's not saying who's doing or how they're doing or you know and that's what's panicking people so why don't you help people out and help them with the panic because stress can cause heart attacks strokes and god knows what so help them out and there has been a bit of I won't say secrecy but a bit of silence surrounding the sorts of people who are dying from this not really. There, there, there's a big report from WHO where they looked at 80,000 odd cases in China. And what's, ha- what's happening is the, uh, the death rate is much higher in older people. And it's much higher in people with underlying illness. So a lot of the people who've died have been people with uh, cardiac disease or respiratory disease in their 60s, 70s and 80s. So that's how the figures pan out. Okay. So, like many illnesses, it's more severe in the elderly and it's more severe in those with other causes for ill health. Thank you. Dave sent me this message. 
Hey Dylan, I was just wondering if we could have a quick uh, question there for the doctor. Um, we're due to go to uh, Spain in the Costa del Sol in uh, early June and the wife now is kind of freaking out. Uh, has she got a reason to be freaking out or should we be kind of putting the holiday on hold? Cheers. Now I wouldn't be expecting you to answer that at all as to whether <laughs> or not people should go to Spain on their holidays and it's going to take a very long time before people are given specific travel advice like that. Yeah, it is. I mean, I can answer what I'm doing. I'm I'm supposed to go to Spain at the end of this month for work for a day. And at the moment, I'm planning to go. Okay. What it'll be like in June, I don't know. And nobody else does either. Watch uh, this space. Watch this space is right. Uh, Karen sent this. Hi, Professor Steins. Um, I have suffered with pneumonia in the past and have been hospitalised for it. Does this put me at greater risk um, in the event of picking up the coronavirus? Thanks. That's an interesting one. Um, would she be at greater risk having had pneumonia in the past? If she, if there's an if she has an underlying respiratory problem, so if she has some underlying lung disease, yes, she would. But pneumonia is not uncommon, and you can get really sick with it. But you can make a perfect recovery and have perfectly normal, healthy lungs afterwards. Okay, it, dep- it depends if she, if there was a reason for it. I have two more messages. One is from Gareth. Hey, Adrian, I'm just wondering, could money be a carrier of this virus? Could money be a carrier of this virus? Or you mean pounds, shillings and pence, like your your euro notes? You, almost anything can be a carrier of the virus, but the, the evidence is that people pick it up from contact with things that other infected people have touched recently, because the virus does not seem to last all that long. In the outside, in the outside world. world, yeah, yeah. Okay, and a final message from Ali. Hi, we're due to go to Disneyland Paris next week, um, and I'm a bit nervous. Just wondering, should we go or should we cancel? Again, Ali, Thanks. I'm not even going to ask the professor to answer that question because um, <laughs> I don't expect anybody to answer that question. That is a decision that you have to make for yourself. I'm sure you'd agree, Professor Staines. Yes, I would. Mm. My final word to you is, what, what is the, the one sentence you would say to people who are very concerned about this, who are up the walls with worry? I know even talking to anecdotally to people in this building today, um, you know, people's attitudes range from, we'll all be grand, um, to, oh my God, I think I'll stay at home tomorrow. Um, what is your fi- final bit of advice to people listening? My my advice is the same as WHO's advice, which is be alert to what's going on, but not alarmed. The risks to any individual listening to this are very small. Even in Wuhan, which is a population, I think, of 8 million, so it's almost twice the population of Ireland, there have been 80,000 cases, but there have only been 80,000 cases out of 8 million people. Mm. So that's not good. That's not what we would like to see in Ireland. But it's not the end of the world either. So wash your hands, be alert, but not alarmed. That would be my advice. Professor Anthony Staines, expert in public health at uh, DCU, I really appreciate your time today and thank you for being so uh, informative in your in your answering of the questions. Thanks very much thank indeed. Thank you very much, Eric. Good to talk to you. Bye thank bye. you. There you go. Um, very interesting man. Great to talk to. And I hope that has answered some of your questions. As regards holidays and stuff like that, I wouldn't for a second expect him to say, no, don't go to Spain or don't go on your cruise. Or, um, and until... The Department of Foreign Affairs advises against travel to certain countries. Um, you, it, it's, it's up to you to decide. The uh, website, by the way, is dfa.ie, and that lists every country in the world and gives uh, travel advisories. So, for example, if you go onto that website, have a look at it for yourself if you want to. If you go onto dfa.ie, um, you will see a drop-down menu of every country in the world. So if you go onto, for example, China, it tells you to avoid unnecessary travel to China. So that's telling you, don't go to China. OK, uh, but that same doesn't apply for any other country in Europe except an advisory about traveling to northern Italy. Other than that, they are not telling you not to travel anywhere. So it is totally up to you as to whether or not uh, you go on your holliers to France or Spain or wherever it is. You're listening to 98 FM. The sound of the city from Sally Noggin to Swords. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. It's Monday morning. This is Adrian Kennedy. This is 98 FM. And it is time for that bit of our show that we call. 
tell us something we don't know. This is where we want you to share with us a fascinating fact that you don't know. Now, uh, Professor Staines has shared an awful lot of information with us that we don't know. Yeah. Um, well, he did. I have one that's not as important. Good. But it is something that every single person can relate to. I only found this out the other day, and it's blown my mind. Okay. Every one of you listening now at the moment, think about this. When you're watching a movie at home or a TV show, you know, it could be a movie on Netflix or it could be EastEnders. Mm -hmm. What's the last thing that always comes up on the credits of a movie or a TV program? The very last line, what usually is it? Is it the company that makes it? No, or even the news. It could be the news or anything. It's always the last thing that comes out. The year. The year on which the TV program was made. If you don't believe me, the next time you're watching a TV program or a movie, look at the credits, and at the very end, it will say the year that the TV program or movie was made, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. It's always in Roman numerals, or nearly always. It's like MCM XCVV, yeah, or MCM 1VX, and all that stuff. Why is that? Why did they decide? Well, it's not all companies. RT um, don't. Or the BBC TV. do, though. The vast majority of movies uh, and TV programmes will have Roman numerals. Now, why did they do that? Because your average Joe Soap, Darren and Fingless, doesn't, doesn't know. know what MMXX is. No, I do. It's 2020. Yeah. You didn't expect me to get that. I did didn't you? really know. I though. learned Roman numerals in school. That's yeah. how I know them. MMXX is this year. Yeah. Um, and the BBC, at the end of all of their programmes, put MMXX. RTE don't. Um, they just write 2020. Um, why? What are you getting at here? Well, I know the answer. I only found out the answer at the weekend. Why uh, it's done in Roman numerals. Because it makes absolutely no sense. Nobody uses Roman numerals ever, do they? And why is it done in Roman numerals by it some was, television companies? It was originally done in Roman numerals to deceive the viewer as to how old the movie or the TV programme was. Okay, so say they were repeating. Do you ever watch Virgin Media and they're showing a programme from, like, 1999? Oh, yeah, I was watching one of those Australian immigration programmes. Oh, my God, yeah. It was actually made in 2011. Yeah, ridiculous. And they tried to pawn the... Well, I I don't know if they tried to pawn them off, but they show programmes that are, like, 20 years old. So, somewhere down the line, some bright spark said, well, if we put Roman numerals at the end of it... um, People um, won't know what year it was made. Adrian and Ashburn will look at it and go, I don't know what MCM, XCVV means. Um, so that must be a new TV programme. Isn't that unbelievable? But I know that this show I was watching the other day was made in 2011 because it said MMXI. So that was 2011. MMXI is MM. M is 1,000, M is 1,000, that's 2,000. X is 10, yeah. that's 2010, plus I won. Correct, yeah. 2011, well done. Yeah, but you know that. So they didn't hide it from me. But how many people? The only other place I've ever seen Roman neurons is Rocky. Rocky V Rocky 1V This is the part of the show where we ask you to share with us something that we don't know Okay? It's a fascinating fact It's something you know but you reckon nobody else knows And by the way the show you're listening to to now Copyright 98 Copyright MMXX No, Copyright 98 FM Yeah MMXX Yeah, brilliant 2020 Darren, tell us something we don't know, please Eh... All villains and bad guys in movies, they're not allowed to use iPhones. Why is that? Because Apple don't want their a product associated with villains or bad guys. Really? So if you're watching a mystery movie and people are using iPhones, the one without the iPhone, more than likely going to be the villain. Yeah, that's actually true. This was revealed uh, only a couple of weeks ago, that movie. By Ryan Johnson. Yeah, Knives Out. You know that who done it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Ryan yeah, Johnson so. had a scene in the movie where uh, one of the baddies in the movie was holding an iPhone and apparently Apple said, no, no, cut that out. Yeah, not allowed to do that. Yeah. But how, how <laughs> could they even... strange fact. <laughs> how, how could they even control that? How, how can they dictate... They could sue. They could sue. For what? For bad placement of, of their product. Really? Yeah, probably just not let them use the product in the show, so it won't be as realistic because obviously people would have iPhones. But I would, I would have thought a lot of bad guys the world over have iPhones. Uh, apparently, it's Samsung. Oh, yeah. Right. This this all started, by the way, in that TV program Twenty Four. Remember Jack Bear Twenty Four? Yeah. Yep. Um, is that he? I think he had an iPhone at the time. No, he didn't because it was out before the iPhone was out. But he had whatever phone he had. But he did have a he did have a PDA. Do you remember those? I think it was. Uh, there's one with loads of buttons on it, anyway. A phone with loads of buttons on yeah. it, okay. Um, and that that's how it all started. Oh. Yeah. So if you're watching, if you watch uh, Narcos on Netflix, yeah? Yeah. Where they're, like, k- 
killing each other to, to bits um, and you see them making a phone call hello Rodriguez you have to come down here and kill this man he won't be making that call he on won't be iPhone. making a call on I phone I never knew that thank you Darren uh, Rebecca you're on 98 FM how are you Rebecca I'm good how are you Rebecca uh, tell us something we don't know um, the Canary Islands are named after dogs not birds <clears throat> Oh, hang on. The Canary Islands are, are named, named after yeah the dogs. What does a dog called the Canary? <laughs> My friend said that to me a while ago, and I thought it was madness. So hang on, I, I, I would have thought that the Canary Islands were named after a bird of some sort, m- namely so a, a canary bird. Jeremy, are you finding out the answer to I this? I have the answer for you already. Oh, Adrian. brilliant, okay. Uh, the Canary Islands, which is Lanzarote, uh, Tenerife, yeah. and uh, um, the other one. The known First Ventura. First Ventura. They are named after... La Gomera. The, where? La Gomera. La Gomera. Nobody goes to La Gomera. Uh, they're named after a dog called the Canarian Mastiff. <laughs> Um, and he's an oh jeez he's an ugly look although all Mastiffs are ugly looking yeah, aren't they this is particularly <laughs> this fella's particularly ugly looking and I'm going to show you a photograph of him oh god yeah, yeah. he's an wouldn't ugly wouldn't like to meet him in, uh, on the beach on your holidays <laughs> and they originally came I presume this fella um, comes from Lanzarote although he doesn't look very happy that he's in Lanzarote <laughs> uh, but yeah that's so the Canary Islands were named after what's the name of the dog again the, the, the canary and mastiff. Oh, so not a little tweety bird. No. No? Okay. That's a fascinating fact, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing it with us. No problem. Bye. Thank you. What is your fascinating fact? Tell us something we don't know. Call us on 6797 You can text, WhatsApp, or send us a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. Oh, sorry, just about back to the uh, the, the, the baddies using. They're not allowed to use uh, MacBooks either. I don't know. No. So the goodies in a movie can. That's how you will know, they're saying now. In a, in, you know in those whodunit movies, who's yeah. the baddie and who's the goodie? Uh, you will always know because um, the good guys will be all using Apple Macs and the bad guys will be using PCs. <laughs> and this all stems back to Jack Bauer. It's all to in, in 24. In 24, Jack Bauer. Yeah. I actually saw him in concert the other night, by the way. Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland? Kiefer Sutherland, yeah. Oh, he's a singer. Yeah, brilliant. Brilliant singer, brilliant band. What? Saturday night in the Academy is a great kick. Um, now, Cora sent us this WhatsApp voice note. Hi, guys. Can't uh, come on because I'm busy in work, but I've got a couple for you. Um, ben and Jerry's ice cream is packaged upside down, hence when you open it, it's always so full. So I wonder if you were to cut it from the other end, would it just be all air? Um, ketchup was sold in the 1830s as medicine. Uh, the name Wendy was made up for the book Peter Pan, um, but there was never recorded Wendy beforehand, so the name was like pretty much invented. Um, if you squash a wasp, it releases a scent to alarm other wasps. It's in danger, and they all turn up. So, do you ever notice that you, if you get stung, they'll all just start hovering out of nowhere? So, so now you know. God, Corey, you'd be great to go on a night out with. Are you being sarcastic? No, she's just filled full of information about everything and anything from Ben and Jerry's. But that's true. I just looked that one up. The Ben and Jerry's is true when they're milking it up and all that. Uh, it's poured into the jar uh, upside, upside down. down. Have you ever noticed? Have you, do you eat Ben and Jerry's? Yeah, the odd time. I yeah. eat it like it's going out of fashion. When you open a tub of Ben and Jerry's, yeah, it's, give. it's level with the top. Yeah, completely level. There's not even a, a millimeter no. I give. That's the reason. Oh. Okay. What about um, uh, that name she was talking about, Wendy? What about Wendy? What about her? She said it didn't exist. Wendy doesn't exist? It was an invented name. Um, Anyway, I'd love to go out on a night with you, Corey. You you sound like fascinating information you have in that head of yours. Uh, John, you're on 98FM. How are you, John? Hi, lads. John, tell us something we don't know. So, basically... If the fuse goes in your plug, right, yeah. and the shops are closed, and you, you've no way of getting the fuse, if you wrap that fuse in foil, pop the back end of the plug, plug your plug in, the plug will walk again. Yeah. And now, that, uh, ele- electrocute yourself No, you, as well. you won't, but I wouldn't be recommending it either. Because well, no, I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, if the shop's closed, then, you know, you a temporary thing, you know. It is, yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know the last time I had a fuse yeah, actually fuse, go in a fuses plug. Fuses don't go anymore, do they? I, don't, I can't um, remember the last time a fuse blew in a plug of mine, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's probably, they're probably more updated now, but some, an awful lot of people probably still have the older ones as well, you know, just... Okay, so that's a simple solution. Simple solution. Thanks, John. Actually, Adrian, you blew a fuse last week when I put the wrong collar on the air. Yeah, I did, yeah. You literally... I blew three fuses. <laughs> Adrian's trip switch, literally... 
Stephen sent us this WhatsApp voice note. Ice lollies were invented by an 11-year-old uh, boy, I think. Um, it was d- completely by accident. <laughs> That's a fact. What was that he said at the start? I didn't Ice catch lollies. Who calls it ice lollies? Ice pops. Ice pops were invented by a kid. Yeah, they actually were in San, Fr- oh. in San Francisco yeah. um, in 1905. Yeah, basically a young fella. His name was Frank. Who calls a child Frank? Well, my granddad was Frank. Doesn't sound like a child's and name, though. he would have though. been born about that time. Ah, look at little Frank. <laughs> Go on, anyway. Anyway, Frank uh, was out playing uh, outside his road um, in San Francisco in 1905. And um, he bought some sugary powder, basically. You know, you know those popping, popping powder things? And basically he thought to himself, what, what would happen if I were to add this sugary powder into water? So he got a glass, Adrian. Yeah. And he put the sugary powder into the glass... And then he realised, oh, it's, it's, I won't have it yet, so I'll keep it in the fridge. In the fridge. So he put it in the fridge and forgot about it. And then a week later, remembered Frank. Uh, the mother said, Frank, what did you put in the fridge? And he took it out and it was a frozen lollipop. And he licked it. And, and Fra- it was yummy. And Frank said, oh yeah, I'll have a bit of that. That's amazing. Just don't call children Frank, though. <laughs> it just doesn't sound like a kid's name. My granddad was born in 1905, believe it or not, and his name was Frank. Well, imagine going up to a pram now. Look at how cute that little... Look at the little dimples on the boy. What's his name? Frank. <laughs> Stephen sent us this voice note. Ice lollies were... Oh, sorry, I played that. Kira sent us this. If you change the camera settings on your Android phone to audio that says cheese, you literally just say cheese and it takes a photo for you. Say that again? You can teach your phone, your Android phone, yeah. to answer to the word cheese and take your photograph. How do you do that? I'd love to do that. But I'm not going to s- sit here for the next hour and a half going through it. But no, but I have an Android phone. Does she expect- Yeah, Google it. Google it and find okay. out for yourself. Um, James, tell us something we don't know. The band Spandau Ballet got their name from uh, Nazi war criminals being hung at the end of World War Two. I think I heard that before and I think you might be right. Jeremy, where does Spandau Ballet get their name? I'm not that fast. Hang on. <laughs> um, um, it refers to uh, the term the locals used um, dancing the Spandau Ballet was the dance they did when they'd be hung and a friend of the band actually seen it in a nightclub in Berlin, I believe. Yeah, that's in a, ni- a nightclub jacks. It. Yeah, it was written on the nightclub jacks wall. Right. And the fu- another fun fact related to Spandau Ballet or at least the prison is that uh, after World War Two, after all these criminals had been hung, um, one man was left. He was guarded by four different countries for the rest of his life because he was the only person left in the prison. Remember you were looking for someone to come to your house party the weekend, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's the man. Invite him, go on. And the last fact related to it is after he died, the locals um, wanted the prison to be kept up. The British had it torn down and turned into a British services shopping centre and the locals then started referring to it as Hesco's uh, after the the Nazi war oh, criminal Rudolf Rudolf Hess. Hess. Oh. here's a question for you then Mr. Know-it-all yeah <laughs> you, know, you know the place where everybody goes swimming naked on Christmas day down by Kalini yeah yeah what's it called Kalini Bay no no the 40 foot the 40 foot yeah, yeah 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 where did the 40 foot get its name I'd say from the length of a walk you have to go from the shore cross out no uh, is it 40 foot deep I know the answer I happen to know the answer um, because I was swimming there one day and uh, I met this fellow who's a historian and he told me why it's called the 40 foot I can tell you now my, many of you have swam there it's not because of the depth of the water the water's not 40 feet deep there would you stop <laughs> well, what is it you dip your toe in there it's not because of the depth of it and it's not because of the distance you have to walk and you, and you won't find the answer to it on Google either well, then tell us. I'm not going to tell you. What's the point in this part of the show? I'm not going to tell you. Just going to wreck your head. Paul. Good morning, lads. Did you know that the cream cracker was invented in Dublin by an Irish man? There you go. I think Jacob's cream crackers were the very first. I'm, I'm checking it as well. Okay, good man. Yeah, you're right. It was invented in Waterford. Yeah. Uh, by Mr. W. Jacob. Yeah, there you go. Jacob's cream crackers were the very first. Yeah. And finally, Nana. My name is Nana. Um... I just want to let you guys know about this, that the Chinese doctors confirmed that African blood genetics composition resists coronavirus. That's one of the things we don't really know. Thank you. Nana from Navan. 
Now, I don't know how true that is or otherwise, now. Sorry, if you have African blood, is that what he's saying? You're more resistant to coronavirus. It's blood, is blood. Isn't it? Uh, so I, 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 we can't confirm or deny that that might or might not be true. But thank you very much indeed. I would say not. Uh, uh, would you not? I don't. I don't know. I'm not an expert in coronavirus. Yeah. What about the forty foot? You're not going to give us the answer. You know, you're just going to swan off out of here. And just going to swan. Or just the next time you're driving by the forty foot to have a dip or whatever, and you think it's because of how deep it is, or because of. No, the well, I'm happy with that information. But that's the wrong answer. No, but I don't care. Okay, if I'll you're not you, going to tell me, I'll tell you next Monday. This is ninety eight FM's Dublin Talks. I'm Adrian Kennedy. We're here until uh, midday today. Thank you very much indeed um, for your. Um, Stuff that we don't know. A lot of it we didn't actually know. Now, next on the program, um, are you someone who uh, started smoking cannabis at a young age? And have you continued to smoke it into adulthood? If so, do you think you've developed any long-term effects of using uh, the drug? Now, there's a reason I'm asking, because a fairly shocking report out today has shown that the number of child cannabis addicts has nearly doubled in Ireland in recent years as the drug becomes more fashionable. Uh, Addiction has soared among teenagers in the past 10 years. In 2018, 621 teenagers between the ages of 14 and 17 received treatment for addiction to cannabis. Um, Cannabis, for some reason, is seen as a much less harmful uh, than other drugs like heroin or cocaine. But a consultant, um, child and adolescent psychiatrist, Dr. Bobby Smith, has spoken out following uh, this report and said it is by far the single biggest addictive drug for Irish children. He said while cannabis can increase the result, uh, the risk of psychosis among adolescents, it is often a classic addiction issue. It consumes their lives. I knew many young people, he said, who uh, get away with it, but there is a significant minority who have their lives devastated by it. And here's the question that I want to ask you. Do you agree with them? Are people who believe that a teen smoking cannabis is no big deal, they could be doing a lot worse, living in a dream world? Are you someone who started the drug at a young age? And if so, what effects have you witnessed with yourself? Call me right now on 6797981. You can text, WhatsApp, or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877 989898. The sound of the city from Adamstown to Artane. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. It's Monday morning. Good morning from Adrian Kennedy. We're here until midday today. Now, are you somebody who started smoking cannabis at a young age and maybe continue to smoke it into adulthood? If so, do you think you may have developed any long-term effects from uh, doing the drug? Because... The uh, amount of teenagers addicted to cannabis has soared in the last uh, 10 years. And all you have to do is look around you and you will see more uh, kids, teenagers, smoking cannabis than ever before. And in fact, from what I can see, they're drinking a bit less but smoking more uh, cannabis because... Maybe it's easier to get their hands on. But anyway, the question is, this is something that... um, um, a Dr. Uh, Bobby Smith has spoken out about and he said cannabis is seen as much less harmful than hard drugs like heroin or cocaine uh, but Dr. Smith uh, has spoken out following a report about addiction to cannabis and said it is by far the biggest addictive drug for Irish children. He said while cannabis can increase the risk of psychosis among adolescents It is most often a classic addiction issue. It consumes their lives. I knew many young people who get away with it, uh, but there is a significant minority who have their lives destroyed by it. Call me right now on 6797981. Are you somebody who started smoking cannabis from a young age? And if so, do you still do it? Or did you give it up? And if you gave it up, why did you give it up? Was it because you could notice um, certain issues developing? Call me on 67979781. You can also uh, text, WhatsApp, or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. Jay, you're on 98FM. How are you, Jay? Morning, Adrian. Now, Jay, you first smoked cannabis as a young fellow. Yeah, it was about 18. About 18, okay. Yeah. 
And wh- why did you start smoking it? Why? Yeah. Well, I wanted to try it. <laughs> it was that simple, and I enjoyed it when I did try it. Okay. And do you still smoke it? Yeah. Daily. So you started at 18, then yeah. do do the maths, how many years you'd uh, smoking it? Well, when I, when I was eight, I didn't start smoking it, like, regularly as such, I was probably in my mid-twenties. Okay. And since then, I've been probably every day. So are we talking 20 years? Yeah, about, yeah. Okay. Um, and you're saying that there is no downside to this? No, I didn't say that, no, no. There is, there, there is a downside to everything. So what's the downside? <laughs> Well, you're damaging your lungs, obviously, smoking. You know what I mean? You're spending money. <laughs> That's lots of downsides to it, but, you know, it's enjoyable as well. Okay, one of the um, things that this doctor was saying is uh, we seem to turn, you know, we seem to look at this drug as uh, it's, it's harmless enough, it's, you know, there's no bad side to it. And in fact, I, I spoke to one parent on this show a couple of months ago whose young fella at 16 was smoking cannabis and he didn't mind. He said he'd prefer him doing that than any harder drugs or getting pissed out of his head. I can see his point, but personally, I wouldn't... If, if I, had, I don't have kids, but if I had kids, I wouldn't want them smoking it until they're over 18 and it's their own choice then, you know? But have you ever uh, experienced any issues in terms of paranoia or psychosis or anything no, like that? No, I've, I've heard of people, though, and as in a friend of a friend, you know what I mean? But I've never experience it yourself. Okay, let me read this message that just came in to me and it says, just regarding the smoking of cannabis, I'm a 22-year-old who smokes cannabis daily. I'm in my final year of a law degree and pursuing a master's next year. Like any drug, such as alcohol or tobacco, in the wrong hands can have negative effects. It doesn't affect everyone negatively, nor the same way. If you abuse it, then, uh, yes, it is going to have a bad effect on you. Um, I'm interested, Jay, yeah. to hear you say that you wouldn't be happy with a 16-year-old, if you had a 16-year-old smoking it. But sure, it's, if it's as harmless as you're saying, sure, what's the problem? Well, we don't know how harmless it is for the developing mind. That's the thing. We just don't know yet. There hasn't been the research done on it. So, like, I couldn't say that it's safe. I, I wouldn't say it's safe because I don't know. Okay, stay there for one second. 67979081 is our phone number. You can also text, WhatsApp, or, like lots of you are doing, send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898. Now, Peter, you've also been uh, smoking cannabis for 20-plus years. Yep. And what did you want to say on this? Well, the, like everybody goes on as if it's a it's a gateway drug. That's a lot. Of, that's a lot of crap. That's, you don't take a blow off a joint and take heroin. Then, you know what I mean? No, you, you don't. But yeah, if oh, you look right, at sorry, if you look at somebody who's on heroin or um, is a regular cocaine user, if you look back in their lives, they probably started on cannabis. But if you also look back in their lives, they are probably already abused and uh, stuff like that. You know what I mean? Now, like, everybody goes on and is like, oh, kids with cannabis. When kids are driving down the street in the car, there's pictures of beer and alcohol everywhere. When you see ads for beer on the telly, what are people doing? They're always having fun. It's always a party and stuff like that. But when you see an ad for cannabis, it's always dark and dreary, you know. Be aware. The main people who don't want cannabis legalized is Diageo. That's who doesn't want cannabis legalized. The likes of states in America, like California and Colorado, who have legalized cannabis, alcohol sales, have plummeted. Okay, but, uh, but we're not talking about legalisation at this I, I moment. Can, I can understand that, right? So then, if, like, what, what's safe? What would you rather? Would you rather your children going out and getting a bottle of vodka in Tesco's? Or would you rather them getting a bag of... Most kids who smoke weed aren't going out to fields. When they go out to fields, it's because it's taboo. That man and dad don't want to. I'd rather my son in the house with his friend. When I smoke weed in my house, it wasn't my mates. We were playing Xbox. He went out in the field running the muck. Do you know what I mean? And the science is in. How many people die every year because of alcohol-related diseases? How many people every year? How many people every day die because of cigarette-related diseases? A lot. How many people a year die from cannabis? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Zero. Well, that's what you're saying. The only way you're going to die from cannabis is if a CIA drug plane is flying above your head and they drop a bale of cannabis on your head. (laughs) Okay, but but, uh, okay, let's. Let's not skirt around this. The fact of the matter is, you are, if you're smoking it, you're not doing yourself any favours at all. Because if you're, if you're smoking, anything, inhaling any type of smoke any, isn't anything, a good thing. Yeah. 
we can understand it. So that's why we, we need to legalise it. Get people educated on it. And like, if you make, if I was to open up a cannabis store, you make the license for me to sell that really hard to get and really hard to lose. It's easy for a child to get their hands on a bag of weed. It's not easy for them to get their hands on a bag of cans. Because if they buy a bag of cans, if they got to catch them, and the off license is thrown out, they'll be shut down on fire. Whereas it's little John out down in Grandale on Tallow or whatever selling a bag of weed. And he probably sells a bit of coke as well. That's how kids are getting introduced to it. Why, what should I so what you're about? saying to me is, despite the fact that we have a um, record number of teenagers being smoking. treated, being treated, uh, firstly smoking it, but also being treated for addiction to it. Right. You're saying it's far cannabis less harmful itself, than... But, yeah, because cannabis itself has no actual uh, chemicals in it that make it addictive. What happens is people become dependent. Now, 15 years ago, you would have been on a radio show talking about the level of alcohol drinking with kids and when cannabis use wasn't as high because it was still kind of underground. Mm. Whereas now... The, the science is out. The cat's out of the bag. We know. Like, look at that. People talk about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia in the human population since the 1960s has been at 1%. It's still at 1%. Whereas cannabis, cannabis abuse has skyrocketed since the 60s. And schizophrenia rates are still at 1%. Okay, d- it, are you telling me that in 20-odd years of smoking, if you felt nothing harmful at all? I got no, I, I'm not saying everybody aging. I know people who who can drink a litre of vodka and not a bother to them whereas I just take a shot of vodka and puke in me I don't drink at all because I just smoke even when we go to a pub I just bring a few pre-rolled joints with me and the lads will be like I have a drink and I'll go here and smoke my joint do you know what I mean because drink doesn't drink doesn't agree with me whereas I know people who cannabis like, not everybody can smoke cannabis and not everybody can drink alcohol do you know what I mean some people will have different effects for you like I'm not addicted to it I, 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 I grew up before oh you say you're not addicted to it 20 years of using it would say otherwise. Well, if I was addicted to it from the moment I w- woke up, I need to have a joint. And then, I, when, then when I see me buzz going, I need to have another joint. I'm up at half three in the morning, I start work at four o'clock. I don't go home till five o'clock in the evening. My first joint is at seven o'clock in the evening. You ask most people who go to work in a building site, they come home and they have a pint or a bottle of beer to relax and wind down at the end of the day. So if I want to smoke a joint at two before, when I come home, you can't go to bed at seven, I smoke my first joint at seven. I don't smoke in front of the kids. They don't see me rolling. Okay, now, uh, uh, Peter, there are medical reports that suggest that marijuana can be uh, addictive. And, um, you know, I, I know you're saying you're not addicted to it. But if you didn't yeah, have I'm that saying, one... I'm not saying people can't get addicted to it. People become dependent on it. And the, one, another reason why teenage use, people going in for uh, addiction to cannabis and it's going through the roof is because of the new cautioning system that the guards have bought in. in front of your car... If what's happening now with kids is a 14 or a 15 year old is getting caught with weeds, they have a choice. You can go to court and you can get fined and you might be sentenced to prison. Or you can go through this treatment program and you won't get a criminal conviction. What do you think this child is going to pick? OK, stay there for one second, Peter. 6797981 is our telephone number. Uh, you can text, WhatsApp, or send a WhatsApp voice note to 0877989898, like Paddy just did. Hi, uh, Adrian. Um, it used to be harmless, um, smoking cannabis, when, when all we had was, was a bit of hash that you used to be able to get on the streets. Um, that stuff was maybe 3 5% um, strength. But now all you can get is weed everywhere, and that's up to 25%, even more some, sometimes, you know? Um, so it has changed, like. Okay, thank you, Paddy. Quick break, we're back in a sec. The sound of the city, from Balbriggan to Blanchardstown. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks. It's Monday morning. This is Adrian Kennedy with you until midday today. Um... If you want to get in contact with us, send us a WhatsApp to 0877 98 98 98. Um, we're talking about a report, a shocking report, actually, uh, saying that the number of teenagers aged between 14 and 17 uh, receiving treatment in Ireland for addiction to cannabis has skyrocketed. The numbers of teenagers using cannabis, and I'm, I'm sure you can see this for yourself, has skyrocketed. It is, according to many of our callers, easier to get your your hands on uh, some cannabis than it is to get your hands on alcohol. And we're asking about the downside of it. Um, Do you think we have a problem here developing with uh, young kids um, addicted to uh, cannabis? 
Call me now on 67979981. Now, Katie, you're on 98FM. How are you? Hiya. Katie, you've been smoking it for years. 25. 25, to be precise. And you've a young fellow of 19 who also smokes it. Yeah, he doesn't drink. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like drink at all. So he just, we was out one night and they had a giant and he smoked that now. He'd only smoke it in the evening probably when he come home from work and he'd be in bed and all at half nine, ten o'clock. He'd probably have two giants and go to bed. He wouldn't smoke it around me now. He'd be out with his mates. And does that, and, bother, does that bother you? No, I, it, does, it doesn't bother me. I'd. Would you prefer I'd, if he I'd, wasn't doing it? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I, I'd rather um, to smoke um, cannabis than drink. The drink, uh, it uh, brings out the bad in everyone, the drink. But uh, cannabis, no, I don't, I don't agree it brings out the bad in everyone. Well, most people, especially young kids coming up that are only 17, 16 and 17, going around drinking, and there's nothing but fighting and stuff like that when they're out, especially kids when they're out drinking on the streets. But I, I don't have, I don't, I don't have a problem, and I think uh, cannabis is grand, but not uh, not before the age of eighteen. I don't think. I think younger kids should not be smoking it. They're only grown. And but, but when I hear. You see, yeah. this is where the problem is, and this is why, you know, having a conversation like this, I'm always very conscious that we don't portray it as this wonderful thing that everybody should be doing, because I don't believe that's true, and I would hate to think of um, a 16-year-old hearing this conversation and going, oh, jeez, that sounds deadly, I think I'll do that. It's, there's no downside to it at all, because that's well, what an awful lot of you are saying. I've never found a downside to it. Nothing. So, not not a thing. Um, as years ago, I drank myself. Then I went off to drink. Um, I, I just had enough of it, and I ended up then, I started smoking, and not a bother. Not a bother. I've, so I've never looked back. Okay, so it, it, are you addicted to it? No, no. I only smoke it now probably at around 6 o'clock, 7 in the evening. That'd be it. I'd have probably two or three joints, and that's me done then. And what about, say, in, for example, if you go on a holiday? Oh, well, I've never been on one. Have you never been on a holiday? No. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> because, for example, I know of somebody who went on a holiday, who smokes it every day, and spent the yeah. first day of his holiday searching around the resort to try and find somebody that he could get it off. Well, that's that's a sign of addiction. Most people do when they go on holidays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's the sign of addiction, is it not? Well, it's just like you going over to Spain going, right, come on, out drinking. No, but I don't have to go sp- wasting a whole day going searching, looking for a place. Well, you wouldn't need to. Uh, well, this day and age today, it, wouldn't, it shouldn't take it a day to get somewhere to get cannabis. You'd find that within five minutes. <laughs> okay, but in, in, again, to go back to the point, you're saying you don't want, you, you wouldn't like to see 16-year-olds uh, smoking No, not, not that are only, not children that are only growing. Um, but do you, not get the, do you not get the kind of hypocrisy in what you're saying? You're painting this as a... That's I'm the best not, thing no. ever. No, I'm not. I said about children shouldn't smoke at 18. You do what you want when you're 18. If you want to smoke a bit of weed when you're 18, fair enough, smoke it. You're not sticking needles in your arm either. And look, look at how A lot of people children. believe that's the next step, though. No, it's n- Well, here, I'm an example. 25 years. I've, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch cocaine. I wouldn't touch heroin. I wouldn't touch tablets. Not one thing would I go near because I, 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 I just know myself. I'd never go near anything like that. And the cannabis, it, it, it just relaxes you. That's all it does for you. It relaxes you when you're sitting down in the evening. It does nothing else to you. And all this about psychosis and all, there has to be something wrong with people first to end up then smoking cannabis. And, the, and 25 years is not a thing wrong with me. I haven't been sick in around 15 years. Don't oh. get colds, don't get flus, never suffer from anything. All right, again, I have to remind you, Katie, that perhaps irresponsibly you're promoting this as just the most amazing thing ever. I'm promoting it, but not for children, I'm not. Any, anyone at age of 18 should not be smoking it, I said. Okay, stay there for a second. Uh, Michael, you're on 98FM. How are you, Michael? How you doing? Michael, you're in a similar situation with the teenager you're smoking it. Yeah, I started off smoking when I was 15, yeah. And smoked it daily for nearly 15 years, so... um, Yeah, but look, look, it didn't really agree to me with me coming towards the end of it. Um, In what way? Having, like, I started having panic attacks, so I just couldn't relax. Like, you know, people are saying there, like, you know what I mean? You're, 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 you smoke it to relax in the evening. It was actually having the opposite effect on me. 
So as I said, like for years I smoked it, years and years and years, and then just towards the end it just didn't agree with me. Um, my girlfriend, I was even saying, you know I mean, you're a different person when you don't smoke it, so literally I just gave it up. Okay, yeah, well, back. in fact, then, you might agree with this message, then. Uh, I used to smoke it regularly enough. I used it for my anxiety, but actually found, due to things going on in life, it was actually fueling it. Makes it worse. Makes it worse. And look, I'm we mates still smoke it and all, like, you know what I mean? And, like, uh, I've nothing against people that smoke it. Don't, couldn't care what you do, to be honest with you, but it makes it worse. That's the truth. But, like, you sit down, and if you have any worries in life at all, like, and you sit down and you smoke it, like, you're sitting there on your own thinking about it, and... It just it does make it worse. Like my girlfriend, like my, my fiance, like says I'm, like I'm a completely different person. Like my man, always telling me for years, you're paranoid, you're this, you're that. Like now, look, don't get me wrong, I wasn't wasn't walking around like like I needed to go to a mental hospital or anything like that. You know what I mean? But it just it does fuel the anxiety. And okay, do, guys, it says on my screen that you've a young fellow of eighteen who's also smoking it. Me no. no no I don't have it no 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 Michael no. doesn't have a young no I, I have it no I don't I don't have it I don't have a young for eighteen but no I have smoked it since I was fifteen but and even I was over in Amsterdam there a couple of weeks ago and I've been over there about six or seven times now and I actually didn't even smoke when I went over there this time and I had the best time over there of all the times I've been over there okay so. so your point is that despite people like Katie um portraying a wonderful picture um, there is a downside to this and we need to recognise that there's a downside to it look there is a downside and I can guarantee you now all them people there that are saying like you know it's not addictive it's not addictive guarantee you when the person that they get it off hasn't got it on a Friday they start bleeding freaking out mm. trying to get it do you yeah. know what I mean that, that, it, it is addictive like it is like whether they say oh it's scientific this scientific. like it is addictive like, my mates and all, they'd be still freaking out. There's a drought, as they call it, you know what I mean? They'd be still freaking out trying to get it on a Friday or whatever. I mean, he hasn't got it. And then, like, like my brother was only ringing me there the other day. Uh, I was like, I haven't smoked in two years. Like, I don't know what you're ringing me for. Like, I, I don't know anyone, you know what I mean, that sells it anymore. So. But, like, it is, like, you know what I mean? It is addictive. Whether they like to say it or not, it's, 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 it's very addictive. It's not a gateway drug, to be honest with you. Like, that, I never found that. No, you your may mate, not have your, found that, but... Your mates but, are more so, you know, but the, 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 the group you're with is more so the gateway into into oh, other, into other you know stuff, what I mean? Yeah. It's got more of a peer pressure thing. Like if you do, if you just smoke cannabis, like you're not going to be thinking, oh, I have to get something better. Do you know what I mean? It's not like that at all. Like you know what I mean? That's one thing I will disagree with. It's more so the the group you're around and the peer pressure, the group you're around that lead you into other things. Not smoking it. You know what I mean? All right, uh, stay there for a second, Rachel. Tell me about your experience. Hi, Adrian. Um, I started out smoking weed when I was a teenager. Um, it started off as an odd one here or there, and then obviously led led to more like every day it was um, and then what happened to me was I tried to give it up and I couldn't sleep at night time so I turned to harder stuff which uh, left me I lost I lost everything lost I mean you time. say harder stuff what sort of stuff like tablets I was taking tablets to um to, to put me asleep and stuff like that and then I wasn't bothered with the weed I, I, I ended up in treatment um the end of last year and I was there for five months and I'm, I'm clean now seven months the best thing I ever done but of course it's addictive. My sister is a psychiatric nurse. She works with patients every day suffering from psychosis and all the mental health side effects from, from smoking. It's crazy people saying... And do you think... Yeah, well, that's what I was about to say. For the, for the many calls uh, that we have had saying, you know, oh, this is grand, it's no bother. Are, they, are these people who are living in denial? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, they just they obviously don't want to give it up. And like I was like that myself. I, I I said it wasn't addictive for years because I just didn't want to admit it to myself. You know, that sort of way. I didn't want to say oh, I'm addicted to this, so I have a problem. And I think that's what other people are doing. They're, they're saying it's not addictive because they don't want to face the reality of of how hard. Yeah, so it is they are literally do. living in denial. Absolutely, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, stay there for a second, Scott. You're on ninety eight FM. How are you, Scott? Hi, how's things, Adrian? Grand, thank you. Uh, thanks. You're 22. Yep. Smoke it regularly. Yeah. Um, what age were you when you started? Uh, I'd say it would have been maybe 14, maybe 13, 14. 14? Yeah, so I was quite young, but it was probably to do with the group that I would have been hanging around with. And, but, um, okay, so you were smoking it from 14. I assume those at home had no idea. Yes, of course. <laughs> So, six, seven years later, you're still smoking it regularly. But those at home know now that you do it? Yeah, they do. Okay. And um, let's talk about addiction. Are you addicted to it? Uh, no, definitely not. 
So if uh, there was, as we heard, it's an expression I'd never heard before because I don't smoke it myself. If there was a drought <laughs> this weekend and you couldn't get your hands on it, would it bother you? Absolutely not, no. So why do you continue to smoke it then? Why? Um, see, uh, mainly to do with everything that's around me. So between college, work, all like that, everything can be quite stressful. So for me personally, it's something that I might like to do. Okay, because we heard, we heard a couple of minutes ago about how despite your belief that it may help with anxiety, it can actually contribute and make anxiety worse. Yes, of course. Um, like, I've seen it in some cases where people have severe panic attacks and that they can't cope, and I just have a feeling that it might have something to do with how much they're actually consuming on a daily to weekly basis as well. And the, some of these, uh, some of the marijuana that can be found around could be sprayed with stuff. Uh, I've heard stories of that in the past. Um, nothing that I've witnessed, but I have a feeling that it might have something to do with how much people are consuming and the levels of THC. Which we heard earlier on, where there. it used to be 5 or 6 or 7%, now it can exactly, be up to 25%. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's an awful lot stronger. The, the question with regard to addiction, Scott, um, that I have to ask you is, why don't you stop it? I mean, obviously, Why? you don't see any downsides, but it, it's clearly not uh, good yeah. for you. Of course, yeah. Um, I, I do see that as well, but um, the likes of me, I don't, I don't drink at all. <laughs> so and, you I, see, that seems to be everybody's excuse um, yeah. for doing it. Well, I don't drink, so that makes it okay. Um, I, I mean, the, as this message just came in, all those people saying it's not addictive, yet they're smoking it years. Yeah. So why don't um, you stop today? I'll think about it. <laughs> I know. Um, I just personally like to do it. It's my personal preference, and it's something that I like to do in my spare time to rewind. Okay, but you you would maintain that you're not addicted to it. Yes, and you could stop tomorrow if you wanted to. If, of course. Um, Rachel disagrees. Rachel believes that you. Clearly are addicted if you haven't stopped or you can't stop. Look, I'm, I'm out of time. Thank you, uh, Scott, for your honesty. And thank you all of you for your calls. This is 98FM's Dublin Talks. Back again tomorrow morning at 10. Barry Dunn is next with some great music in the next hour like these. The Sound of the City from Ballybrack to Ballymun. Dublin Talks. 98 FM's Dublin Talks.